ました。Thank you. Buongiorno.、Uh, I hope you had enough coffee because I, I needed some after last night.、Um, so this talk is actually more about、uh, evolving landing、uh, infrastructure and needs, and I, I focused a little less on the processing and the, and the algorithms used. But I'm happy to answer questions if there's anything else. So there's actually only one or two slides on the software. Um, but we'll get to we'll get to understand why we needed、um, such a robust set of tools, and thankfully the community supporting that. So、um, let's just go ahead forward.、Uh, what is I am from USGS. I'm not officially、uh, supporting USGS for this talk, but I do work there.、Um, we I happened to be on vacation and was invited by Alessandro and、uh, Luca to present. So. Astrogeology was founded in the 60s. We're just about to celebrate our 60-year、uh, anniversary in supporting the U.S. space program.、Uh, we do lunar geologic mapping and landing site characteristics from all the way back to the beginning to now,、um, and and now Mars, of course. And we still actually do astronaut training in Flagstaff, Arizona. There's a lot of lava fields out there. There's cinder cones, and so it makes a perfect analog site for the moon.、Um, this this next Over this next month or two, we'll be training astronauts、uh, at midnight, in the middle of dark, because we're going up to the moon, and they'll be going into dark shadows where they don't have any sunlight. So they'll have these giant LED on their on their、um, headlamps, and they'll they they have a giant rover that they get in and out of, and it'll be completely dark. So it'll be interesting training for everybody.、Um, at Astrogeology, we do support a lot of things for NASA. We are. Uh, funded by NASA, 99% funded by NASA, so we are not、um, congressionally funded as most USGS facilities are, and we support a lot of standards,、um, a lot of them non-geospatial. For example,、um, nomenclature. We support、um, not always naming them. There's a whole group that names features,、uh, but we support the maintenance of that database. We support planetary geodesy, which is very obviously critical to geospatial. Uh, and again, geologic mapping. We support the publication of、uh, the the GIS datasets. We we produce the we still actually print these maps, which is nice.、Um, PDS is the planetary data system. Alessandro referenced this in his talk, and basically that is how the data is archived and and published public, fully public domain, 100% public domain. And we actually collaborate with、um, the European. Uh, side of the data archives, the, the Japanese, Korean. So we we support、um, and we work with all sorts of space agencies.、Uh, another aspect that we do is cartography mapping、uh, using MapSet and, and NASA working groups, and then we get down to kind of the more geospatial, the phosphor G type applications. And so、um, web standards. We we try to、uh, work with the OGC to implement planetary. It's been a long road. It's tough. When it's a niche application to support planetary and OGC, when 95% of the application is Earth, right? And so, getting getting people to not lock into WGS84 is hard,、um, and it's 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 been a long long road, probably you know 15 years or so.、Um, and we also do really really facilitate try to facilitate GIS format standards. For example, a lot of this is is not necessarily Working on the standard, but making sure it can facilitate planetary. GeoTIFF, because I, not because it was、um, originated at JPL, but it's happenstance that it's always supported planetary very well.、Um, some of that is because of the verbose map projection header. So it's not a code; it's not a single code. It has actually、uh, verbose keywords in the GeoTIFF, and so it's always been able to support、uh, different radii,、um, different centers. Um, Geo package has been tested well known text two. We actually changed a, a tiny part of that standard to support triaxial,、um, triaxial bodies. And in general, we don't actually support triaxial bodies in mapping applications, so don't don't be afraid.、Uh, we mostly support spheroids for the weird shapes, the the potatoes for the asteroids and comets.、Um, we've actually implemented a couple、uh, planetary style projections in、uh, Proj. And then we we are just dipping our toes into stack, and、uh, we actually have.、Um, we'll, 
Amazon has just given us um, about a terabyte of space, and we'll put about a terabyte of planetary data into a S3 bucket. Um, we also help with the community sensor model. I call it camera sensor model here. And that is the actual uh, implementation of the, the lens distortion, everything you need to do orthorectification, everything you need to know to put an image on the body. And so um, that was a, that, a very military-based standard. It used to be called the tactical sensor, sensor model. Um, when, we, when we got there to the working group, it was interesting to understand that they were actually interested in supporting different radii. So within a year, we were able to implement uh, variable radii into that standard. Um, and again, when we first saw it, it said WGS84 all over the documentation. So thankfully, within a year, we were able to change that standard. Um, lessons learned. This has been 30 years for me uh, supporting astrogeology. And it really is to help make the data the focus. Applications come and go. And I know we talk a lot about applications here. Um, but understanding how to make the data uh, analysis ready is critical to produce it and to release it. That's a, a we've had an, an issue, not always an issue in planetary, but over the last decade, um, you know, a scientist will sit on their data and they won't release it because they're afraid somebody might abuse it or, or misinterpret it. And so I think we're, we're finally getting over this stage. There is a, a new effort called the planetary data ecosystem now, and that is to facilitate ARD or analysis ready data products. And, and again, something that, that I've um, grown up with is open standards and of course open source is widely beneficial. Um, we've, as USGS, all of our code is open, public domain, but we weren't acting as an open source project. We were just throwing it over the fence and hoping for the best. We were trying to act like an open source project now, and I'll go over those uh, software. And also always credit data providers. If you're gonna repropose, if you're gonna use their data in, in an interface, always credit it, but the data providers need to provide good metadata too. So it's a two-way street. So let's jump to Mars. Um, this is kind of the, the, the NASA goals. And this has been changed a little bit because of the moon. The effort to the moon is, is changing our, our, kind of our timelines to Mars, but we're still heading there. So we can see that um, we're just starting with uh, commercial and commercial payloads. We're starting to, to pay, you know, SpaceX, uh, Blue Origin, all those companies will have um, different aspects of lunar and Mars missions. Um, and we're, we're focused kind of right here in these landers. We have plenty of orbiters. There's orbiters from uh, India, from uh, United Arab Emirates, from um, ESA all at Mars currently. China, I believe, too, is heading, is either there or heading there. Um, but we're gonna, today, we're gonna focus on the rovers here. And right now, the, there are um, two active NASA rovers, uh, and um, they've, every single one of them in the last decade has outlived their uh, lifespan. They were, um, the MER rovers were supposed to last 90 days, and they lasted 10 plus years. Um, so it's impressive. Um, so how did we support landing sites uh, from Mars Pathfinder? This was in the late 90s. This was my first go around to, to supporting landing site analysis. Um, we had kind of a very, not a great instrument. It's called the Mars Orbital Camera. It was about the 10, the five meter um, per pixel. Uh, and you can see, you can see here, we've had a lot of issues. When, when you get stereo on Mars, you, and you're doing a stereo intersection between two images, you can't tell that there's a bunch of movement in the image here. But when you have a stereo pair, you end up what's called jitter. And you see this, that's not, that's not real. And that is from spacecraft wobble from the solar panels. Uh, this happens on Earth, but much less. And so we have to do, we have to play a lot of games to help smooth out that jitter. And we've, we're actually implementing a lot of different algorithms to support uh, de-jittering. Um, but that was a really challenge. And, but one of the reasons why we didn't have to worry so much about the quality of this DEM is that the way that, the way that we land, this was back in the 90s again. So we have, we come down into the atmosphere, we open up a giant para parachute because of the, the atmosphere is less dense. Um, and you can see it, it slows down and then we have the, um, the actual, where the rover is sitting is inside the shell. We have the, 
the rockets fire to slow it down even further, and then it keeps, keeps slowing down, keeps slowing down, and then it drops. And what does it drop? Drops this giant airbag. So again, 90s technology, you can see this, this airbag is trying to eat that person down in the, the bottom right. And the rover is sitting in there. It's a triangular shape, so no matter how it lands, it can open up. Um, and so, but what is this holding? This is holding a 10 kilogram rover. And that's about the extent of the airbag. And so if we were to land, if we had the data today, we would have never landed here. So this is, again, in the 90s, we didn't have the resolution to understand how rocky it was. This rock right here, uh, that's, you know, death knoll without the landing, without the, the um, balloons or the, the landing airbags. So now we come to the modern era, and we have our 1990s rover at 10 kilograms, and we go, now we're trying to land a 1,000 kilogram rover. That's about the size of a car. You can see somebody could jump in there. Um, and it's just massive amounts of instrumentation. There's instruments all over this arm. There's a laser uh, to actually shoot rocks, and then they, it puffs, and you can get a spectral signature from that puff. Um, there's uh, energy, there's power in the back, and you can see these massive, these massive wheels. So what technology do we need to land that guy? Well, airbags don't work anymore, so you actually have to you actually have to land it softly with these rockets. And so we, this is called a sky, sky crane landing technique. It was used in the last rover too, the Curiosity rover. Um, let me go back to that. Am I going backwards? There we go, okay. Um, and the real trick here, the, the reason why we needed such, we worked a very long time on our data products and worked very long time on making sure that the, the suite of software we used within the, the GIS world was stable and reliable. Um, we had a, a, a large team at USGS, actually not that large, it was about less than 10 people, and then we had a, an, another team about the same size at JPL, and we val cross-validated, we used different camera models, we tested each other's camera models, and the reason why we really needed our images to be perfect was because this sky crane actually loaded the image on, on, on the rover, and as it came down, it did image matching to find a safe place to land, all autonomous. The delay time between Earth and Mars is 20 minutes, so it has to work autonomous. Uh, it's fully, fully automated, and let's look at the, how this works. So to be able to get to some of those rocky places that we all want to go to for the good science, um, you have to be able to uh, land in these rocky areas. And, and currently, the, the old landing sites, even though that was very rocky, had to be very, very clean. Had to be like a parking lot. And so being able to find science in a parking lot isn't always the best mix. We want to be able to find, we want to be able to go near, next to cliffs or crater walls. And so being able to do that, you have to have this uh, automation. So our image mosaics that I'll show next uh, is basically, again, on the, on the board, the spacecraft, as the parachute deploys, it will actually let go of the lander, and then it will fly itself, and as it's doing uh, image matching techniques, it's finding out where it is in the mosaic, and then it's gonna find itself a safe place to land. Um, it's also, I mean, it has onboard LIDAR, of course, but it really needs to, the, the LIDAR isn't fast enough to understand if there's rocks. And if this lands on a giant boulder, it's gonna have a problem. And so the baseline, our slope baselines are, are very critical. So why are we going to Mars? This is just kind of to take a, take a step back. It's, um, we wanna understand the geologic context and history. There's a lot of astrobiology to learn. Um, this mission is actually collecting samples. So there's a bunch of vials, I think about 20 vials. It's collecting samples. There'll be another mission that, that returns to, to the same location, collects those samples, and then um, rockets it back to Earth. So we'll see, we'll see how long that takes. That, that is gonna get pushed back because the samples aren't going anywhere. Um, so as we go to the moon, the, the actual sample return might take uh, another decade to come back. Um, but also we're looking forward to human exploration. So terrain hazards to consider, rocks, 
high slopes, we can't land on high slopes. Um, fresh craters, if you land in a crater, you might not be able to get out of it. Um, if you land in a, an area that's very dusty, um, the actual retro rockets might not be able to slow down. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of technical hazards to consider. And the site selected for um, is Jezero Crater. It's actually hard to see in this 3D representation, but there's a crater wall here. There's a channel coming down, and there's an, a nice old delta here. Um, obviously, um, hydro orient or hydro, and it's so that's where we want to look for astrobiology. And I, I don't know the status of that for the mission, um, so we don't have any answers yet. But we'll see. So the the actual landing ellipse is eight kilometers. Uh, that's much smaller than previous. Um, so here's, what does it mean in terms of, of trying to make this mosaic and landing this, this image? Um, we have to have lots of data, lots of duplicate data, lots of stereo, and then we um, generate that into that mosaic that's loaded on the spacecraft. So, um, so the actual um, truth again, is loaded on the spacecraft. Here's all the, the statistics for that, for that image. And the, the, actually, we have a, a DOI here if you want to download it. Um, here's the high resolution image. This is a 25 centimeter per pixel. That image was just used for the, um, the hazards map. So I'm going to go, this is basically the open source workflow. We have the USGS ISIS-3 software, which is um, integrated uh, software for imagers and spectrometers. It's, it does the initial camera model, the initial image calibration, and also JPL NAIF does the spacecraft location. Weird. Let me go back there. Sorry. I just gave it away. <laughs> I don't know why it's skipping. Um, so we actually do have one commercial application in the suite. We use BAE socket set, which is a uh, off-the-shelf stereo it's, it's a soft copy photogrammetry system. The reason why we actually still use this suite is because it has manual editing. So an operator can look in stereo and edit the DEM in 3D to make sure that there's no blunders. Um, they can actually validate it. Every pixel can be validated manually. Um, but we also use NASA uh, AIM Stereo Pipeline, which is an amazing stereo correlator. It's um, highly under, underrated, or undervalued, I think, and it does work for Earth. Uh, it has a lot of algorithms inside of it. It uses GDAL. Um, it does ICP, which is how to generate, how to register 3D point clouds to each other. And then we also used um, QGIS and Saga to, to do a lot of the uh, evaluation and um, a little known uh, thing we call, we'd like to use uh, called IM Core which was does, does a normalized cross-correlation to look at the distortions within the images. And so um, that was critical. So this is, this is kind of why I'm here. Um, you can see what we also support the standards. Um, and then I'm going to go. I'm going to jump to this. We are starting this so fly right maneuver. this is the, this is the, the accumulation of all that technology. In preparation for and I'm sorry, this is a two-minute video. To over to give the radar a better look Since I have one minute left. I'll try to explain it as we go. This is, this is, this is real, real video. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed, and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity so you can see is 480 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Heat shield set. Perseverance has now slowed to so subsonic speed and the heat shield has been separated. This allows heat shield disengage. both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second at an altitude of about 10 kilom 9 and a half kilometers above the surface. So about this time, the actual spacecraft is using that, that image that's on board. It's starting to locate itself on the, on the actual real image. It's doing um, very quick, real-time uh, image matching. Nav filter converged. Velocity solution, 3.3 meters per second. 
Altitude 7.4 kilometers. Now so you heard that. They said that the, the image, Current they figured out where they are. is about 100 meters per second. And here's, one, six here's that delta. 6.6 kilometers of the surface yards. So we're still in the parachute mode. Perseverance yes. is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. OVF valid. We have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution right and there. part of Sorry. terrain relative navigation. Priming. TBA is nominal. We have priming of the landing engine. So the I think I think right now the engines engines have fired. You can see them in the images. At about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars, we have confirmation that the back shell has separated. So it let go. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here in safety, Bravo. So there's actually a microphone. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about. 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. It's finding a safe place to land. We this doesn't look safe. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are but it, there's, conducting the sky it, crane. It's because it's so, there's just, the they're just white maneuver. rocks, so it's flat. This is actually a video of the, sky crane maneuver it, has now started. it's lowering. So the, the spacecraft about 20 meters with the off retro the rockets lowered the rover down. This is called the tether, the umbilical cord. And this is, and this is actually how the images are still getting to the space Tango traffic. Delta. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. So the, the bottom line is that without, without the Phosphor G capabilities, um, this, this would have been extremely tough to do without having support in GDAL, without having support from NASA Ames, from JPL MAIF. Um, it, it's, in all this, uh, we're working with JPL to open source a lot of the software that you've seen here. Um, I don't know if the, if the actual uh, auto navigation software will be released, um, but we're looking at the dejitter code. There's a lot of accumulation code to make these DEMs perfect. And um, anyways, and the next step for TRN for this technology is the moon, and we'll see that happen in the next couple years. Thank you.